So I want to begin with a massive purchase, an acquisition you did, but it's really in, in many ways a change in strategy. You just earlier this year, you bought a company called Metadata, a U.S. company, um, for $5.8 billion or so, $5.7 billion, something in that range. It's a lot, it was your largest purchase by far by a factor of seven or eight or something um, that you've ever done. And when you think about your company, is about uh, 3.4 billion euros in sales each year, uh, 3.8 billion dollars. I mean, that is, a, that is a very large commitment. Tell us why you did it. Well, first of all, I agree with you. I have no more money, so. <laughs> uh, but uh, the point is the following. Uh, we have observed the um, uh, life science sector for years, and I, I think it's a little bit provocative what I'm going to say, but if, if airplanes were done this way, a company will do 100 airplanes, put them in the air, and look at the one which is flying, and say, this is the way, this is the one I'm going to produce. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say is we need to, contact, to connect a clinical trial with modeling and simulation. Mm -hmm. On MIDI data, it's about a clinical trial. They do 50% of the worldwide clinical trials. So they analyze the data from these trials? Yes. 20 years worth of trials. They organize the trial, right. target them, and then analyze the data, capture the data, and create what we call virtual arms. So next time you do it, you can compare one trial with a virtual one. So it's very key, uh, especially in a sector which is highly complex yeah. as the bioscience, uh, on connecting now this to the power of modeling and simulation, I believe can be game changer for the industry. That's why we did this move. So combining imaging, or in your case, this 3D imaging or simulation with a new data platform is this idea of supercharging this. And so you'll notice a theme here uh, for those paying close attention, because I'm going to follow up with that same question to you, Kieran. This is, this is your holy grail, right? Combining imaging with uh, new data, data platforms, and figuring out different ways to, to analyze that data. You just got FDA clearance for a, a type of lung cancer scan or lung scan that allows you to identify pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. Tell us why that's so important. So, uh, first of all, uh, in the world we live in, uh, there is a lot of data, but far too often not enough insight. And so, what we are trying to do at all times is take data and from that data create insight. And so if I look at that along, you know, three axes, uh, your example is perfect for where uh, a radiologist or a physician that's under stress uh, has maybe 200 scans to read, 200 uh, scans of various kinds. The x-ray that included that pneumothorax right. could be sitting four hours down in his workflow. And the beauty of what we've done is you know, and that's life or death. Life or yeah, death. Right. So it goes maybe from up to eight hours down to 15 minutes. This is right at the top of the queue. It, it is flagged that the, this patient has collapsed lung. You need to pay attention now. And so the, the, this di digitization, digitalization right. uh, gives, gives us the chance to be faster, for uh, reduce stress for the uh, mm -hmm. Uh, physician and obviously much better outcome for patient, which is what we're all trying to do. And Bernard, you know, when people talk about bringing AI into the system, I've, I've heard you say this is like, we've been doing this for 25 years. I mean, you were doing it uh, secretly as a defense contractor. Uh, but I, you, you have this extraordinary thing. I want to show the audience. You do this 3D brain virtualization. Um, and in fact, we've got some images, and I'm wondering if we could show those images and if you could just talk over them for a second. We can look at them on the screen. Yeah, tell us what yeah, we're saying. This is, um, <coughs> this is the reconstruction of, uh, in 3D of a brain with all, um, all the characterization. It's, it's the follow-up to what we did for the Living Heart program. Uh -huh. Living Heart was adopted by the FDA, uh, as a matter of fact, as the best platform to uh, investigate uh, 
heart surgery. So we are doing exactly the same here, but don't, don't, don't think it's only geometry. It contains all the characteristics, electro characteristics of the brain. So you have the characteristics of the brain, you have uh, all the conducting elements of the brains. So it's what we call multi-physic simulation. Mm. Now, um, so we've been doing this for aerospace in multi-physic simulation for years. Yeah. I, I remember the time where people told me, you will never simulate an airplane taking off. Or today, we don't do physical prototyping and the first airplane will take off. Right. So we are applying that same discipline of uh, representing complexity and addressing three things. Mm -hmm. Collaboration between disciplines which don't necessarily understand each other. The memory, meaning you remember sense, the experience. Sense memory too. You're actually, you're not reading in a book, you're actually doing. Absolutely. Protecting. Yeah. And then everything related to capturing experiences and comparing it to the real life yeah. uh, of, of passion. Uh, so it works very well for heart surgery. Right. So we want to apply it to brain now, and we have also done it for propagation of cancer in human cells. Right. You know, I'm, I'm just interested um, because effectively, that's what we are trying to, we live in an ecosystem, and I think we were talking about this backstage. Our industries are fragmented. And so if you think about uh, what we're trying to do, it's a very similar concept. It's how can we create a platform for the ecosystem where we can bring different communities, say, for, you know, Vance mentioned it earlier in relation to uh, uh, clinical studies. If we can integrate what pharma companies know with what's in the medical records, mm -hmm. with imaging, uh, with genetics and, and uh, meta metabolomic uh, data, all of a sudden you have this much better uh, three, uh, 360 degree view of the patient. The, it's the integration of that data that's really powerful, which is yeah. kind of similar. Yeah. Our intent is to really do the virtual twin right. of an entire human. We did it for planes and cars. There is no reason we cannot do it for, for human. And, and the problem, you know, is people are over communicating and they under understand each other in those disciplines. It's siloed, That's right. as, as we, That's right. we, we discussed. It's very siloed, but innovation will come from the cross, the cross examination of things. So, but you are going through this transformation between the, the sort of world of steel and aluminum and, and you know, widgets and hard things like that. You wrote a beautiful essay uh, for the, the Nikon Kogyu Shimbun, which is the, the largest business daily, or one of the leading business dailies in, in Japan. And you wrote about, and I'm gonna quote from this, I believe in the century of living matter. Industry will be remodeled by the biosciences, the material sciences, and the information sciences. Tell me what you meant by that. Well, if you look at the 20th century industry, it's very siloed. It has been based on a limited number of principles, physical principles, chemistry principles. Even pharmacy with small molecule, it's a, you know, you see in front of you here, 28 molecules. 28 molecules, what do you mean? 28, a human body well, is 28. This is 54. I knew we 28, were... 54. Think about it. I knew my phone was smarter than me. I didn't know it was more complicated than me. It's more complicated and less smarter. Right. I think. Oh. Uh, but the point I want to make is when you observe the world of living, mm -hmm. you discover things that have never been applied to the industry. <laughs> and to your, to your question about your question, I think today we can create materials from the atoms. Mm. You know, it's the 150 years anniversary of the Mendeleev table. It's a very important table, wow. the periodic table. And there is a limited yeah. number of elements, 28 here, 54 in my, 58 in my phone. And when you, when you think about those 28, it's magic. So the point is- So what would is, cliftonium be? What's the, new, what's the new element that you would create? And we'll name it after me. Well, first of all, with uh, additive yeah. Additive printing, whether yeah. it's living or organs oh. or static, you can start from molecules or from human right. cells and print 
new tissue, new, new skins. This is happening as we speak. So there is no reason why this will not change the frontiers of the life science world. Um, it's happening in biologic, right. because biologic is quite complex, and it's not a small molecule, it's a big molecule, and it's difficult to produce, and it's difficult to replicate in, in, at scale. So I believe modeling and simulation will transform that, and that's what I wanted to communicate that. So well, you're also a scientist by training, and uh, by virtue of you being Irish, you're also a philosopher, <laughs> as I said, just like Bernard. So, um, but you know, you talk about uh, the ways in which we're gonna see truly transformative change. I mean, we're in the age, we've been in the age of the gene, we, were, we went through the age of the computer, we're now in the age of confluence, where all of these revolutionary technologies, 5G, AI, sensors, big data analytics, the new science of I.O., they're all coming together and you're combining many of them in your business. Where are we going to see the benefits of this? So uh, I think ultimately it, there are three beneficiaries. Um, economies, because if you look at uh, the cost of healthcare and the waste that occurs today, uh, we can't afford to keep going the way we're going now. And so achieving better productivity, achieving better outcomes is going to help eventually. I know you were going to ask me when and quantify. Yeah. It will happen at some point. And I think if I look at, uh, at, at national level, if you can you know, transform, and the, the NHS in the UK that I'm familiar with, they're starting to really start to integrate uh, how they look at, first of all, healthy, volunteers now, track them over a number of years and see what changes that occur uh, in many different molecules of their body lead uh, to uh, disease. And I think that's going to provide a whole new rich uh, data set that's going to be very interesting. But, you know, at a, you know I know Steve Corwin here in the audience, he's, he's very interested in short term, what's this going to mean for hospital productivity? And for hospitals today, we can see that using digitalization and combination of data sets means that, and we've proven this with use of things like command center, we can reduce waiting time in the emergency department by up to 35%, right. which is really important for patients. Uh, we can sp speed that patient through the hospital safely and create, you know, in, in one specific hospital, it was 50 extra beds in capacity in a year. And you're doing and you this say, with well, sensors? that doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, 50 beds doesn't matter. It's a million dollars a bed. Wow. So, I mean, for a hospital, it's, that's important. Right. When and you get your hotel room bill for here, a million dollars a bed. <laughs> you know, the south yeah. sur cause of mortality yeah. af after a heart accident mm -hmm. or uh, oncology is error in practices. Think about it. Human error. Yeah. Human error. Why? Because it's still, there is no way to be virtually trained. Right. You, you, uh, you only practice as a top specialist. You would not put a pilot in a plane without virtual training. Right. So, uh, for example, in the children's hospital in, in, uh, in um, Boston, uh, they are using the, not the living brain, but the living heart, I mentioned, to plan all children repair on a small heart on reviewing all the characteristics on the different options before going to the surgery room. I was discussing with the doctor last week and he was telling me that he received children who have been, which have been operated across America where he has to fix the previous errors. Mm. So I think the, it's not digitalization, it's a virtualization of those practices that will make them pervasive, reliable, auditable, which is not the case today. Mm -hmm. And think about the training of new, new surgeon. Right. So uh, I think it's game changer uh, for the entire sector. So I think it's clear that the technologies that you are both talking about up here are making us better, smarter, faster, more reliable, less error prone. 
what isn't clear is that they're making things cheaper. And, you know, for, for both of you, when you, you brought out your phone before, Bernard, and, you know, we know this thing called Moore's Law where we get, you know, more and more uh, productivity for less and less investment and less and less cost. Uh, and yet in healthcare, for whatever reason, it seems to be a reverse Moore's Law, right? The costs keep going up and up. When are we going to start to see this? Yeah. Look, I think it's going to change quite soon. We were talking about cell and gene therapy earlier. I mean, the early days of cell therapy uh, and immuno-oncology, for that matter, have ended up with very expensive treatments. But, you know, we will end up within, I suspect, within the next 10 years with more allergenic rather, as opposed to specific patient treatment, right. more allergenic treatments, and that will bring cost way down. And uh, fundamentally, you know, the, the principle of precision, of precisely diagnosing a patient and giving them a cell or gene therapy, it, this is transformational for the whole pharma and healthcare industry, uh, combined with, I think, uh, technologies in the hospital that uh, you, you're putting patient, people into hospital only when they need to be there. Mm. You reduce hospital-acquired infections when they're there. You get them out of the hospital as quickly as possible and through various mechanisms. You monitor them in a social setting when they've been treated. I mean, I think the ecosystem we're working in now is everybody's incentivized to make this work. And it is an ecosystem, and uh, that's why we're investing in something called the Edison Platform, because effectively the industry needs a host system to allow algorithms and data to be gathered uh, so that it can be utilized more effectively. Yeah, I've heard that you, know, you both work with ecosystems. You create your 3D experience labs and partner with a lot of startups, many of which you'll invest in later. Um, what is it that, that is the, so effective about that model as opposed to just going out and buying the company? Well, innovation, the speed of innovation, <clears throat> uh, the uh, freedom uh, to try many things uh, quickly, uh, and, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, really what, under attraction of talents, mm -hmm. because you know, so many young generations want to be their own entrepreneur, and uh, if we can help them, we have a gigantic ecosystem. We have about 40,000 partners. 40,000 yeah. partners. You know, 1.5 wow. trillion of innovation programs are based on that system in the world. So we are a very secret company. Wow. Uh, and we don't talk too much about our company, but we are there on so many sectors. The point I want to make for the cost, uh, because I think it's a very important, you know, this industry has also been living as a rich industry, yeah. uh, as, co as compared to many other industries. <laughs> we must admit it. The second thing is 20 years of protection uh, for uh, patents, right. 10 years to develop, half of it is for clinical trial. So you on so many failure that you need to compensate with the successful blockbusters. And then you have the summary of the industry. So it's about success rate, it's about speed, and it's about better targeting. So I believe that uh, this industry is like the industry of uh, aerospace on space 30 years ago, document-based, Please provide the documents that proves that you have done the right thing, <laughs> but you never know if the document represents the reality. FAA, 30 years ago, was receiving documents that would not represent what was flying. Right. With modeling and simulation, FAA received today experiences that does represent the plane which is flying. Document base versus the distance between reality on virtuality is reducing. And, and that will change the industry. And the laws of flight don't change that often. Um, and yet, the, you know, what we're learning about the body with you know, the immune system's ability to be harnessed now and fight things like cancer, or what we're learning about the brain, this last frontier of, 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 of humanness. Um, and, and this is changing all the time. Our knowledge base is doubling and tripling and changing all the time. 
What, what do you look for in terms of a regulatory environment that speeds innovation? And I want to get a question here too, so if you're yeah. thinking about it, yeah, we've got one up in front. Get the thing. I, I think, look, and very simply, in the, we need the regulatory environment to fully utilize the data that's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think there's a huge challenge in all of the regulators now with the emergence of AI because all of a sudden the speed at which these tools can be developed and deployed has changed the has provided them with an enormous challenge and of course these some of these things if they're not properly developed and curated with really good data can be dangerous right. and uh, again that's why I go back to the platform we only put things in our platform that are based on data sets that have sufficient volume and sufficiently well curated that they're going to be safe right all right, we have a question right here. You just please identify yourself. Yeah, Rama Rajdi, uh, head of Bureau of United States Press Agency. Thank you for this very inspiring uh, panel. Um, your biotech is uh, obviously at the cutting edge, and when it comes to the uh, uh, the brain, it's fascinating, but it's also very touchy uh, as regard of the mystery. Uh, you said that you capture data, and is it only for purpose of surgery and research and development, or is it also for defense uh, purposes? And the second question, sorry, it's going to be a very short one. Yeah. Uh, are you sharing this with the global uh, hospitals or it's going to be remaining only private? Thanks. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, capturing the clinical trial is about capturing data. Uh, I think the value of clinical trial sharing is very high on the, the company called Medidata. What, this is exactly what they do. So when a, a new player will do um, clinical trial on a new molecule, let's say. Uh, the previous experiences, anonyma, anonymized, will be used to do what we call virtual arms to compare to other possibilities and therefore enrich the, the level of quality or targeting or risk assessment or efficiency assessment of the clinical trial. Yes, of course, the value is about sharing. Right. And that's the mechanism. It's not used for anything else, uh, well, of course. Kieran, we have 40 seconds left. Um, you're an almost $20 billion company. If, health, if GE Healthcare stood by itself, it'd be 160 on the Fortune 500. Um, there was talk about spinning it off. It get, fell off the table. Is it back on the table now? So I was hoping we'd run out of time yes, before I, you asked right. me that I had question. to get it in, yes. <laughs> As well, so uh, I'll make a couple of comments. First of all, I'm very jealous that Bernard had so much money to spend. Yes, yes. Um, so, at, look, at some point, and we don't have a timetable, uh, we will probably um, emerge from under GE. But, um, you know, as you said, GE Healthcare is a $20 billion business. Um, we're the third biggest med tech company in the world. And uh, we... Uh, we have global scale and we're big enough to stand on our own two feet at some point. Well, thank you. Kieran Murphy, Bernard Charles, thank you so much. Great conversation.